So this was supposed to be a Halloween video, but I wasn't able to finish production on it in time. After all, Sableye is the perfect Pokemon for that terrifying occasion, as it's a ghost dark type. Did you know that before the introduction of the fairy type, this type combination had no weaknesses? So yeah, in Generation 3, Sableye can't be hit for super effective damage. Making this defensive type even better is the fact that it has three immunities, to normal, fighting, and psychic. However, that's where its defensive prowess ends, as it only resists the poison type. That leaves it being hit neutrally by a total of 13 of the 17 types present in the games. Sableye is based on the Hopkinsville Goblin, which is a creature from an alleged Kentucky alien encounter. It was described as having shining eyes, small legs, and a swaying motion in its hips. By the way, Sableye does have this in its 3D model. I think it's a pretty cool inspiration for a Pokemon, plus I love sci-fi horror and so does my fiance. It's actually her favorite genre of horror movies. Today, I named Sableye Hopkins as an homage to its inspiration. For base stats, Sableye has 50 HP and speed, it has 75 attack and defense, and 65 special attack and special defense. So it's a very balanced Pokemon. It hits slightly harder with its physical moves than its special moves, ghost attacks are physical, despite how little sense that makes, and dark type attacks are special, so both of its types will be hitting decently hard. Unfortunately, it's not very fast. So much so that I don't anticipate it outspeeding any of the particularly fast opponents throughout the playthrough. Hold on to that because I'm going to mention it really soon. First, let's go through the move pool. Sableye starts with Scratch and Leer, and it learns Nightshade, Astonish, Faint Attack, Knockout, Confuse Ray, and Shadow Ball through Level Up. Honestly, a decent set for a Ghost Dark type. Would have been nice if it learned Crunch, but overall I can't complain. From TMs and HMs, it learns Water Pulse, Calm Mind, Dig, Psychic, Shadow Ball, Shockwave, Rock Tomb, and Aerial Ace. Plus, it gets all the moves that all Pokemon have access to, like Hidden Power. For my challenges, I'm trying to figure out how fast a Pokemon can beat the game, so I allow myself to manipulate my starter. After all, I'm replacing the game's default starters anyways. Today, I'm going to give Sableye Hidden Power Ice, because in general, this is the best default Hidden Power typing, and it's going to help against Winona, Drake, and Steven. Now, remember when I said hold on to the fact that Sableye is pretty slow? That's because I decided to give it an impish nature today, and I really need to explain this one. First, I think it's the perfect thematic nature for Sableye. It just looks very impish. It looks like it's going to play a trick on you and steal your jewelry or something like that. In the past, I've been told to not use natures that lower my speed. In this case, Sableye is so slow already that even with a nature that boosted its speed, it's not going to move faster than Pokemon like Salamence. Overall, I'd just rather cut my speed and improve my physical defense, which hopefully will give me more survivability against Steven, since that fight really needs to be planned for. I'm open to the fact that this might be the wrong choice of nature, but I'll have to wait and see. After all, I'm just learning this game. In a few more months, I think I'm going to have a better idea of exactly which natures fit in with which Pokemon. So now let's get going with the playthrough. One of Sableye's major advantages in the early game is its ghost type, which gives it immunity to the normal type moves which are so plentiful here. This isn't the same level of advantage that it would have had in Generation 1. There, basically nothing can hit it before the second gym leader. But here it's still nice because it speeds up most of the trainer battles that it decides to engage in. In this case, I'm going to fight pretty much everyone in the early game because I think this is the best way to play Emerald. After all, in this game, Pokemon don't have access to a broken mechanic like stat experience or the truly awful good AI that Generation 1 has. In Petalburg City, I pick up some repels, help Wally catch his Ralts, and then I head out onto the next route where I continue to fight trainers. In Rustboro City, I grab the HM for cut, purchase some escape ropes at the Mart, and then I continue my training north of the city. I like to clear out all the trainers here before I fight Roxanne, just so I have a few extra levels. And it's worth noting that all this training is really leveling Sableye up quickly, and that's because it has the medium slow growth rate. While the name suggests that Pokemon with this growth rate should level up slowly, it's actually faster than the medium fast growth rate until level 68. I decide to face Roxanne at level 18. At this point, Sableye has learned both Astonish and Nightshade, which are convenient because a rock Pokemon don't resist these moves. Because of the fact that Nightshade does fixed damage equal to the user's level, I can two-shot the Geodudes and move on to Roxanne's Nose Pass. Unfortunately, her first two Pokemon use Rock Tomb, so Sableye has essentially no speed. Nose Pass moves first, uses Block. Well done, Roxanne. That's a waste of a turn. Sableye hits with Nightshade, and it does not quite have. Because Roxanne will use a Potion if Nose Pass survives on a Sliver, I switch to using Astonish, hoping that the next turn I can knock it out with one turn of Nightshade. Unfortunately, Nose Pass heals with an Orin Berry. Roxanne refuses to attack using Harden. 
I use Astonish two more times bringing Nose Pass to a range where Nightshade can knock it out without Roxanne using a potion. Unfortunately this doesn't work because at orange health she heals Nose Pass. Alright I'm feeling pretty silly I should have just been spamming Nightshade here. After adjusting my strategy I knock it out so that's it. Easy first badge for my little ghost alien. Next I decide to fight Brendan. This is an optional battle but in the spirit of gaining some extra experience I might as well complete it now. After all in this fight Sableye doesn't have anything to worry about on his team. I backtrack through the forest head out to sea with Mr. Briny. On Duford Island, I finally remember to pick up the silk scarf right away, and then I grab the old rod and catch myself a Magikarp, which I name Bruno. After delivering the letter to Steven, I think I'm ready for Brawly, and I also think that my typing is going to make this a very easy battle. While the dark type is weak to fighting type moves, so Pokemon like Shiftry and Absol couldn't just do this fight right away, Sableye's ghost typing gives it an immunity. If we examine Brawly's Pokemon's moves, we can see that he doesn't have any options against me. The Machop knows exclusively fighting type moves, and in Generation 3, Seismic Toss can no longer hit ghost types. This was actually changed in Generation 2. In Generation 1, Seismic Toss can damage ghost types. The Metatite that follows can only deal damage with Focus Punch, which is also a fighting type move. So yeah, it's not going to be hitting us either. Finally is Makuhita, and uh, you guessed it, it knows only fighting type moves. So Sableye earns its second badge with a complete shutout. Mr. Briny and I sail to Slateboard, and on the beach I grab the soft sand. After all, this is going to be useful later when Sableye learns Dig. After that I spend some time on the beach because beaches are awesome. Actually, in this case I just want to do some extra training. Here Sableye learns Fake Out, and this move is pretty useful because it gives me free damage at the start of every fight, but the fact that I can't switch Sableye in and out means that I can only use it once per battle. I don't foresee this move sticking around too long as a result. I foil Team Aqua's plans in the museum, and then I head north to Mauville City. On my way, I have to face Brendan, and first is Lombre. I use Fake Out, which does almost half. Nice! This thing obviously doesn't have any particularly good moves though, so it can't do any damage to Sableye and it goes down. Next is Marsh Tomp, and it can deal damage to me with Mud Shot. I go for Astonish first turn, and I get the flinch. That's a 30% chance event. I start using Nightshade, it looks like it's doing about the same amount of damage, and then Sableye gets hit by Mudshot. Okay, there goes my already abysmal speed. At least I take very little damage from Water Gun on the next turn, and then Brendan's ace goes down. All that's left is Slugma. And uh, as we know, this Pokemon is quite bad. <laughs> so I knock it out, now I'm one step closer to Watson. In most of my playthroughs of Emerald to date, he's been one of the more challenging gym leaders. So I decide to face the remaining trainers on this route to level Sableye up as much as is possible. In Mauville City, I grab the coin case, the HM for Rock Smash, which I never could find as a kid, and then I train in the surrounding areas. After that, I defeat Wally and gain access to Watson's gym, where I spend a decent amount of time fighting additional trainers. I'm doing all this training because I really want Sableye to learn Faint Attack, and with it, I think I'm ready. Hopefully this move and the additional levels will give me a quick victory against the Electric-type Master. Watson leads with Voltorb. Even though this thing's fast, Fake Out has priority, so I go first, do half to the Pokeball, and cause it to flinch. Unfortunately, the ball rolls very fast, so it moves first on the next turn, doing a small amount of damage to Sableye before I knock it out with Faint Attack. Electric's next, and Faint Attack just barely doesn't knock it out. Watson selects Howl and then heals with a Super Potion, and it takes Sableye two more scratches to knock it out. Next is Magneton, and this is Watson's most powerful Pokemon despite not being his ace. By the way, I just want to say, I always think this thing has levitate, but it doesn't. Does, does anyone else have that problem? Like, it looks like it's levitating. In its sprite, it even has like a little shadow on the ground. Ugh. Either way, this is irrelevant today because I don't have Dig yet. My Cherry Berry heals Paralysis, but Magneton is persistent and it paralyzes Sableye again. And then it confuses me. Parafusion is extremely annoying, and as a result, Sableye goes down. A few additional levels could be helpful, so I head out west of the city and defeat trainers there. After all, I'll need to backtrack through this section of the game, and bumping into these trainers won't be very fun then. Also, defeating all these trainers now allows me to access the Rust Turf Tunnel, and over on this side there's this little hidden area where I can pick up the black glasses. These will give a 10% boost to my dark type attacks. After all that, Sableye's level 32, which is one level before the next damage rounding threshold. I think it just makes sense to level up for that. By the way, Pokemon gain an asymmetrical boost to their damage when they level up to levels that end in 0, 3, 5, or 8. To get the experience required for level 33, I decide to defeat the Wind Straits, earn the Macho Brace. In this case, it'll be useful if I want to do some Eevee training. 
Uh, spoilers, I don't. But the experience from these battles is useful anyways. Now, let's try Watson again. So here's an example of why a speed lowering nature isn't always bad in these playthroughs. At a tough battle like Watson, you have to grind up to be a higher level to be able to defeat him. Because of this, even with 10% less speed, and an incredibly low speed stat, without Watson's badge that gives a boost to your speed stat, and because I'm gaining stat experience, Sableye is able to move first against Voltorb and knock it out. So yeah, Voltorb very fast, Sableye not very fast, but I'm still moving first. Overall, in these solo playthroughs, the player just has so many advantages in terms of speed, and the AI doesn't have access to those advantages. Plus, when it comes to the speed stat, there is no benefit to overinvestment. Okay, so getting back on track, how much is Faint Attack going to do to the Magneton? In this case, it looks like a quarter, maybe a little bit more. Magneton uses Thunder Wave, my Cherry Berry heals Paralysis, and I go for Faint Attack again, taking Magneton to half, and it paralyzes Sableye on the next turn. There's no way to heal that status now, I'm going to need to get lucky. And that's going to be harder because Magneton confuses Sableye next. Okay, so here's the frustration with Watson. Magneton is so tanky, it takes forever to knock it out. When you finally bring it to red health, he just uses a super potion and heals it. Sableye doesn't have the sustain that it needs, and once again, it goes down. The next level that's good for damage rounding is 35, and I've defeated almost all the trainers in the surrounding areas at this point. So now I'm training on wild Pokemon, which takes quite a while. After getting level 35, I decide that maybe trying to prevent paralysis isn't the most important thing. What if I take the black glasses into the fight? As the battle gets going and I defeat the first two Pokemon, I just want to mention something about my overlay. The powers displayed in the bottom center account for type effectiveness, the same type attack bonus, and item boosts. In this case, you can see that here because Faint Attack's power is boosted. With this boost, it looks like it's doing a third to Magneton. I get paralyzed, but I think I'll get one more hit in. After hitting myself once in confusion, Sableye hits Magneton and it finally goes down. Honestly, I think that level 35 might be the sweet spot for this 3 turn knockout, because Watson might actually use a super potion if I'm level 38 and do more damage to the Magneton on the second turn. Manectric's next, it hits Shockwave, taking Sableye under half health. My ghost snaps out of confusion and hits Faint Attack, which does half, triggering Manectric's Citrus Berry. Watson selects Howl, which in this case is useless considering Manectric's only physical attack is Quick Attack, which is a normal type move so it can't hit Sableye. After my next Faint Attack, Watson uses a Super Potion. Ah, these Super Potions are so annoying. I guess I don't have the sweet spot for this Pokemon. Manectric strikes back with Shockwave. It does so much damage. Ah, oh, it got a critical hit. Just great. So that's another reset for me. Here's the thing though, the fact that I can get back to the Magneton and take it out with 3 hits means that I can get to Manectric in a similar situation. Without a critical hit, it doesn't do enough damage, and I take it down, earning myself the third badge. The reward for beating Watson is TM34, which is Shockwave, and Sableye can learn this move. However, I'm going to keep it for later because electric type moves are much more useful in the late game where there's too much water. It's time to head north of Mauville City. And on this route, I want to mention something that I've learned about Emerald version. When I want to get by one of these spinning trainers, I can use the bag trick to skip them. You just open the inventory and close it and time your inputs well, and then you can walk by the trainers. See, the thing is, in most situations, it's just better to fight them. Unless you're using an incredibly powerful Pokemon, that is. In this case, I'm just going to do the battles, because after all, Sableye is no coward. Additionally, supporting my choice to fight these trainers is the fact that Emerald makes you backtrack through many regions of the game. So whenever you have to skip a trainer with the bag trick, if you have to skip them multiple times, it gets very annoying, and just fighting them for extra levels will prevent more resets later on because you're a higher level. Right now it's my hypothesis that on average I'll actually save more time by just fighting all the spinning trainers than by trying to skip them intentionally. Also, I just want to note some of these trainers are really annoying, like these two. Like, ah, oh, they trap you in a double battle if you try to walk between them. So, like, I really don't want to have the chance of messing it up. I think it just makes more sense to fight both of them intentionally and then move on. After that, I grab the TM for Secret Power, and this unlocks the TM shop in Slateport City. That means I can buy Hidden Power Ice. I'm not going to need it right away though since Flannery's next and fire types resist ice type moves in generation 2 and on. For Flannery, instead I want the move Dig, which can be obtained in Fall Harbor Town inside this guy's house. I take a gondola ride hoping to see a hiker, but he doesn't appear today, and then I have to face Maxi. 
First is Mightyena. It intimidates Sableye. I have no idea how. I'm pretty sure this doggo would be terrified by my alien ghost. That's actually a horror movie trope after all. The dogs start freaking out and you just know something bad is about to go down. Next in this battle, we get to see what might be my favorite ability in action. Mightyena tries to use sand attack and Sableye's keen eye prevents its accuracy from being lowered. Can I please have this ability on every Pokemon in Generation 1? I need it against the rival Sandshrew. <laughs> It takes Sableye a little bit of time to knock the Mighty Anna out, but the Zubat goes down right away. And after that, all that's left for Maxi is Camrupt. Now, I know this thing does have magnitude, but it seems to prefer using Ember on the first turn, so I use Dig, Ember misses, and Dig does about three quarters. Then Camrupt uses magnitude, Maxi heals, and I knock it out with two follow-up feint attacks. I have a brief chat with Archie, grab a meteorite, and then I do some shopping in Laverage Town. Now, I think I'm ready to take on Flannery. She leads with Nummel. I go for Dig, it misses an overheat, and I knock it out in a single hit. Slugman's next, it's really weak of course, and I knock it out with a single feint attack as well. And that's good because I wanted to prevent it from using Sunny Day. After all, having the Camerupt or Torkoal hit a sun boosted overheat is just not good. Against the Camerupt I go for Dig and then it does get a sunny day off. My next attack doesn't take it out, and as a result, Sableye goes down. Out of all the gym leaders in Hoenn, I think that Flannery has been the most surprising to me when doing these playthroughs. She's generally quite challenging. As a kid, I don't remember her being a problem. I do have horrific memories of Watson, though. <laughs> oh, he was awful. In the next battle, Camerupt gets really annoying with Attract. It just continuously prevents Dig from hitting and Sableye faints again. In the next battle, despite a track, Sableye is able to knock the camera opt out and move on to the Torkoal. But I only have a third health left. Obviously this defensive beast, which is clearly a rock type, is going to take very little damage from Dig. Well, it takes half and then Overheat finishes the battle again. Alright, Flannery is getting pretty brutal. Let's try a different approach. Instead of hanging on to Fake Out any longer, I can add Secret Power because it does more damage, and it also has a 30% chance to paralyze when on normal terrain. By the way, Flannery's Gym is normal terrain, despite all the mist and ash or whatever it is floating around in the air. This place is like seriously a health hazard if that is ash, like, or smoke even. Like, gosh, we gotta get some health inspectors in here. Also into Surge's Gym in Generation 1, like trash everywhere. Ugh. The gym leader is trash too. Okay, let's get back to Flannery. Apparently, my rolls against her camera up have just been bad because this time I am able to take it down in a single hit. Next is Torkoal. My health is green, I use Dig on the first turn, and then Flannery selects a track. Oh, come on. I didn't know the Torkoal actually knew this move. I feel like Whitney having a track to make sense. After all, her team has a pink theme, but Torkoal doesn't really look like it should be using this move. Sableye is immobilized by love, but it manages to get a hit in on its second turn, and that's it. So I've earned myself the fourth badge, finally. Now it's time to backtrack through the middle of the map, which I already cleared out earlier in my preparation for Watson. Generation 3 is paced very well until this portion of the game. It seems so strange that Norman is so soon after Flannery. As a kid, I loved this because I just wanted to get to the next gym battle as fast as possible, but now playing these challenges, I really do feel that it's one of the weaknesses of these games. So Norman is the normal type gym leader. So how is his team going to stack up against a ghost type? By the way, it's actually legal to have Sableye against Norman. It's actually one of two ghost Pokemon that you could have obtained up to this point in the game. The other one being Shedinja, of course. I, uh, I don't even want to think about that playthrough, but yes, I will attempt it. So did the developers give Norman moves that can actually hit ghosts? Spinda can only damage Sableye with the use of Teeter Dance but Vigoroth and Slacking have Faint Attack. Unfortunately, Linoon won't be able to do anything for him today because it only knows normal type moves. Also, having Dig on my moveset allows me to really mess with his Slacking because it can always be underground every turn it's trying to attack. Sableye wasn't doing much damage here, making me a bit worried about my PP, but in the end, it's big enough. I move on to the Linoon, and since it can't do anything to me, I've got myself an easy victory. With Surf, I immediately grab the Hidden Rare Candy in Petalburg City, I've been forgetting this in previous playthroughs, and then I start my journey towards Fort Tree City. On my way, I catch myself some HM friends. Thanks for the uh, new turn, Squidgy. After I foil Team Aqua's plans at the Weather Institute, I earn myself a reward cast form. Actually, I remember the cast form isn't the reward. The mystic water that it's holding is the real reward. In this case though, it doesn't seem like it's gonna be that useful, right? By this point, Sableye has learned Shadow Ball, and because of that, it's really starting to steamroll all of its opponents. Brendan's easy to dispatch, and now I've made it to Fort Tree City. 
I just want to mention here that the aesthetics of this place are like amazing. This is so cool. Passing through here as a kid, I just wanted to hang out in this town. I actually would sometimes like just walk around, talk to everyone. I love these little bridges. Okay, enough of that. Let's face Winona. For this battle, I've taught Sableye Hidden Power Ice. It's going to be immediately useful to take care of the Swablu so it doesn't get a chance to use Perish Song. I get the one hit and move on to Tropius, and once again, Hidden Power is the best choice, doing 4 times damage and knocking it out in a single turn. Next is Pelipper. I hate this bird. It goes for Protect, buying time before the inevitable Shadow Ball hits and uh, doesn't knock it out. Just great. Winona heals with a Hyper Potion. Okay, fine. I guess this thing is just determined to waste my time. I should do a playthrough with it soon. <laughs> Maybe it'll waste my time in that playthrough too. I knock the pelican out and move on to the following Skarmory. Please, Hidden Power Ice, do enough. It does about a third. Okay, not very good. Skarmory strikes back with Aerial Ace and it does a pathetic amount of damage. Thanks, Impish Nature. And then I knock the Steel type out over the following two turns. Once again, my damage ranges were just perfect here preventing Winona from using her second Hyper Potion. Altaria follows, I go for Hidden Power, and I was so surprised here when it didn't knock it out. After all, it's doing four times damage to the Dragon Bird. It goes for Dragon Dance, raising its attack and speed, eats its Orin Berry, healing it just slightly. By the way, why does she have an Orin Berry and not a Citrus Berry? We need to answer this question. Because the Orin Berry didn't heal it enough, Winona uses her second Hyper Potion here. I strike with Hidden Power Ice again, taking it back to red. Then she chooses Dragon Dance, and because of that, I've done it. Winona is no more. Between gyms, I like to focus on the awesome aesthetics in Generation 3. Let's take a moment and appreciate how awesome these cute little puddles and lakes are and the clouds that can be seen reflecting in them. The overworld in Generation 1 and 2 feels more like a board game, but in Generation 3 it really feels fleshed out, like this could be a place that you'd live in. When I played these games as a kid, I didn't really fully appreciate this, but lately, revisiting these games as an adult, I've started to enjoy them much more than I did when I first played them. I'm glad that I decided to take this dive into them and give them a fair shot. Well, uh, I didn't actually dive because I can't do that yet. I have not finished off the hideouts. So let's do that now. Mighty Anna is first. This thing is really annoying because Intimidate followed by Scary Face followed by Swagger is just so frustrating. At least today, I get the free boost because I brought a Person Berry to heal my confusion. I knock the Mighty Anna out and Crobat's next. But because of the Scary Face, I'm going to move second and Maxi confuses Sableye before my hidden power hits doing half. Maxi uses a Super Potion and I hit again. It uses Air Cutter and then I finish it off with Shadow Ball. All that's left is Camerupt. It goes for Earthquake, taking Sableye to half, and then my self-inflicted confusion damage takes me to a third. Unfortunately, I'm not faster and it knocks me out with another Earthquake. So I think it's fair here to uh, reflect on the situation where Camerupt moved first. In this battle, Maxi's Camerupt has 43 speed, and after being hit by a scary face, Sableye has 41 speed. In this case, if I had chosen a nature that neutrally affected my speed, I would have been able to move first and potentially knock the camera opt out. So in this battle, the negative speed nature did hurt Sableye. In the next fight though, Mighty Annie uses Scary Face twice. So in this case, my speed just doesn't matter. Sableye damages itself, and that's that. Okay, time for a third battle. This time, Mighty Anna doesn't go for Scary Face because he uses Swagger right away. My berry counters the confusion. Unfortunately though, it does get a scary face on the next turn before I knock it out. Crobat's next. It does a little bit of damage with Air Cutter, and then I take it down. Time to get outspit. Camera up uses Amnesia this time. Instead of going for Dig, I decide to go for Shadow Ball. After all, they're the same power and I get the same type of attack bonus. And in this case, it knocks Camera up out in a single hit. In the Team Aqua Hideout, I'm proud of myself because I don't forget the Person Berry against Matt. Oh, uh, nice jeans, Matt. Also, nice balls. Mighty Anna does get annoying here with Scary Face, but after a boost from Swagger and a heal from my berry, I knock it out and the following Golbat in a single hit. With the hideouts behind me, now I have to face Tate and Liza. When I discussed this run with Leary before I attempted it, she mentioned that uh, they don't really have anything that can deal with Sableye. After all, that makes sense since Sableye is a ghost dark type, essentially the two types that were invented to defeat the psychic type. So let's take what is going to be a fast and easy victory over the psychic type gym. Sableye's even got a helper for this fight, Bruno the Magikarp. I go for Shadow Ball into the Claydol turn 1, Zatu moves first, knocking Magikarp out. Uh, goodbye helper. My Shadow Ball just barely doesn't knock Claydol out. 
I figure I should try to knock it out again since I don't really want to get hit by Earthquake, but Tate and Liza use a Hyper Potion on it, saving it not once, but twice. As a result, Sableye gets confused before I take it out. Next is Soul Rock, and while Zatu continues to set up Calm Mind, I try to knock it out with Shadow Ball. Sableye hits itself in confusion, and Soul Rock hits a Solar Beam. Zatu continues to set up, Sableye hits itself again, Soul Rock uses Flamethrower. Okay, pause. <laughs> Am I gonna lose this? <laughs> well, uh, Sableye survives with a sliver of health. Pause again. At this point, I was thinking to myself that Lyria is gonna be very disappointed with me <laughs> when my Ghost Dark type fails to defeat Tate and Liza. I should have probably prioritized knocking the Zatu out, and then the Soul Rock and Lunatone, and finally dealing with the Clay Doll after all of that, but now I'm in a really bad position. Okay, resume. They decide to continue setting up, Sableye snaps out of confusion, and Shadow Ball knocks Soul Rock out. So I survived another turn, but if I get hit again, it's all over. The sun runs out, and Zatu decides to set up again, I hit it with Shadow Ball and take it down. Please Lunatone, don't attack me. Instead, it sets up light screen and my shadow ball knocks it out. So I just barely made it through the fight, and it turns out, if you know this battle well, you'll already be screaming it at your screen. The Zatu has no moves that can deal direct damage to Sableye, so Confuse Ray is all it has. Also, the Lunatone has nothing that can damage Sableye either. So the three Pokemon in this fight that I needed to deal with as fast as possible are the Zatu, Solrock, and Claydol, and apparently I prioritized the wrong one first. Oh well, at least I have this knowledge for the next time I play a Ghost Dark type in Generation 3, because there's a lot of other Pokemon with this typing. In the Space Center, I have to battle Maxi and Tabitha. By the way, some people have said it's not fair that I have a Metang in this fight, but yeah, that's Steven's Pokemon. I have no choice about it. I was actually surprised here just how good Steven's Pokemon was. I think it got a boost by Swagger early in the fight or something, and it just steamrolled everything with Metal Claw. After that, I head to Pacific Log Town and pick up an additional TM for return, just in case. Then I grab a rare candy. Now it's time to finish off the plot. By the way, I love these little rock puzzles. Game Freak, please give me more of these. I don't want trivial like puzzles where I walk around and press A on things and then like just talk to the gym leader want puzzles give me puzzles make me as frustrated as possible put braille everywhere don't tell me what it is just like yeah that's what i want please uh, scarlet and violet you can do this still i am recording this uh just under a week before those games come out so i still have hope i head into this area and here i have to face archie by the way, this is the first time in Emerald version that you fight him. I remember the person berry, and as a result, I'm able to take a quick victory. Outside the cave, stuff gets really bad, Rayquaza comes in and saves the day, and then Wallace gives me access to Juan's gym. M makes sense, right? Juan leads with Love Disc. I go for Shadow Ball immediately and knock it out in a single hit. Whiskash is next, Shadow Ball doesn't quite knock it out, it goes for Amnesia, and then I take it out on the second turn. Celio is similar to take out and it only does a small amount of damage to me, and then it's time for the Crawdon. Looks like Shadow Ball's doing about a third, but unfortunately it survives the last hit and Juan heals it. I switch into Faint Attack and this is doing more damage so I knock it out quickly. Kingdra is last. It moves first, setting up double team, and then I use Shadow Ball for maximum damage. But I really shouldn't have been doing that because Faint Attack bypasses accuracy checks. I use it next, but I get hit by a Water Pulse first, taking Sableye to orange which triggers its Citrus Berry. But Kingdra, inspired by my Pokemon Yellow videos, uses Rest and heals its status with a Chesto Berry. Ah uh, yes, the rest of Chesto Kingdra. Over the next two turns, Juan uses Ice Beam twice, doing so much damage to Sableye, but it survives on one hit point. However, I'm not moving first, so it's not that hype because Kingdra just takes me out. There's an easy fix here. When I defeated Tate and Liza, they gave me the TM for Calm Mind and the ability to set up makes Kingdra so much easier. In this case, because I have a Person Berry, I can set up against the Love Disc, giving Sableye plus three. After that, I start my sweep. The Whiskash survives, but Celio doesn't. I knock the Crawdont out with two hits. Because of my buff special attack, Kingdra gets taken to orange, uses Rest, but then I knock it out on the following two turns. So, Sableye's made it all the way to the league. Well, I do have to beat Wally first, but that doesn't take much time. With him out of the way, now it's time for Sydney. For this battle, I added Brick Break to Sableye's moveset. After getting intimidated by Mightyena, I decided to set up Calm Mind instead. However, this is a really bad choice as Faint Attack isn't doing very much to these Dark types. 
As a result, I ended up taking a quick loss. A better idea for this fight is to use a Person Berry to heal Confusion when Mighty Anna tries to go for Swagger. To buy time for it, I use Calm Mind, and then once I have my Swagger and my setup, I use Brick Break on his team. However, the AI must know that I'm setting up, and as a result, Mighty Annie uses Roar, ruining all my Calm Minds. One thing about this is that when I send Sableye back into the battle, Intimidate doesn't trigger again. So this isn't as good as getting plus 2 with Swagger, but I'll take it for now. I take the Mighty Anna out with 2 Brick Breaks, and then Shift Trees next. Brick Break does a lot, but it doesn't set up Double Team, and I thought that Faint Attack would do enough, but it doesn't. And as a result, Shift Tree gets Torment off. It's really messing Sableye up after Cacturn goes down and Crawdaunt finishes me off. The next battle, I decided to forego wasting time with setup and just try to sweep with minus one. Once again, I take too much damage, and while I make it to the Absol, it knocks me out. Turns out, I didn't come up with some amazing winning strategy here. In the very next battle, I get slightly luckier, and I'm able to make it through all his Pokemon. Just watch this fight. It doesn't appear that anything is significantly different from the last fight. I just roll slightly better damage ranges and get hit less times as a result. With that, Sydney's defeated. The next trainer in the league is Phoebe, and I expect her to be pretty easy considering Sableye's type. I could have used turn 1 to set up Calm Mind once against the Dusclops, but I went for Shadow Ball instead, and Protect makes it fail first turn. But on the second turn, it takes the Dust Clops down in one hit. That's a really good sign for the rest of the battle. The following Bayonet is a one hit, and Phoebe sends in Sableye. My Shadow Ball does more than half, as well as lowering its special defense, and then it sets up Double Team. I probably should have used Faint Attack here to bypass accuracy checks, also it had a lowered special defense, but Shadow Ball hits for Sableye anyways, and it goes down. The following Bayonet is a one hit, but her Ace Dust Clops isn't. It's obviously a defensive tank, so I'm not scared of it offensively. I knock it out over two turns, and Phoebe was as easy as I expected. For Glacia, I teach Sableye Shockwave, because now it's going to be good against her water types. Because Sableye is a ghost type, and her lead Celio can't use Body Slam against it, that means there's no chance I get paralyzed here. As a result, it's going to set up Hail, and then attack with fairly weak Ice type moves. Because all its attacks are special, setting up Calm Mind boosting my special defense makes Sableye very tanky. Once I'm finally attacking with Shockwave, I've ensured that I'm going to sweep her entire team. Celio goes down in a single hit, the first Glalie does as well, the second Celio faints too, Sableye levels up to 60, luckily this doesn't reset any boosts in Generation 3, it one hits the following Glalie, and her ace wall ring. So that's the second easy victory for me in the league. Drake is next and his lead is Shellgong. This gives me an obvious opportunity to set up Calm Mind once while it uses Protect on the first turn. I've replaced Shockwave here with Hidden Power Ice. Because of my IVs, this move has a base 70 power, and with type effectiveness, it has an effective power of 140. It knocks the Shellgun out in a single hit, as well as the following Altaria. But after that, Drake sends in Kingdra. I don't really have any good moves against it. It goes for Dragon Dance, raising its speed and attack, and it does it twice before Drake uses a full restore. I find it really weird that he's using Dragon Dance on Kingdra, by the way it eventually just attacks with Surf. Like, this sort of thing is the kind of play that I make on this channel. <laughs> uh, check out some of my old vids also for some truly spicy plays. Still, Surf is doing decent damage, and it takes Sableye to orange before I knock the Kingdra out. Flygon's next, and here it moves first, taking Sableye to red before I knock it out, but Salamence is faster, and it finishes me off. I checked my bag to see if there's any obvious solutions, but I don't think there are at this point. Let's try again and see if I can defeat the Kingdra with more health remaining. Unfortunately, this time Shellgun goes for Rock Tomb on the first turn. What are the chances of that? Because my speed is dropped, I decide to set up a little bit more, but the end result of all of this is that I make it to the Kingdra with even less health, and it manages to take Sableye out. I make it back to Kingdra in the next fight with full health. I score a lucky critical hit on turn 1 with Shadow Ball, taking Kingdra to red. This forces Drake to use his full restore early, and I keep hitting with Shadow Ball, knocking the Kingdra out. However, this doesn't solve the speed problem that is the Flygon and Salamence that follow. As a result, that's a third loss here against Drake. Okay, things are starting to get tough. In the next battle, I thought that maybe Shellgun would use Rock Tomb on the first turn again, so I try to anticipate this by using Hidden Power Ice, but this time it uses Protect, and as a result, I have a lower special attack for the rest of the battle. So yeah, Drake beats me again. Trying again without adjusting my strategy would just be stubborn, and I am known for that, but this time I use some rare candies. With three, Sableye is over the next damage rounding threshold. Hopefully this will give it better damage. It might also give it better speed. I set up with Calm Mind once, knock the Shell Gun out and the following Altaria, and then Kingdra hits the field. It goes for Dragon Dance turn 1, I hit with Shadow Ball twice, taking it down to red health, 
and then Drake uses a full restore. However, using Shadow Ball has the opportunity to lower Kingdra's special defense, and it does. As a result, I switch to Faint Attack, and that finishes it off. So I still have green health left now. Sableye obviously isn't faster than the Flygon, so it hits a big Earthquake before it goes down. Okay, it's time for the Salamence. It intimidates Sableye and outspeeds with Dragon Claw, which unfortunately gets a critical hit. Ah, <sighs> so that's it. However, that didn't give me good information, because Drake just got lucky right at the end. Let's try again. This time, I get the same luck with Shadow Ball lowering Kingdra's special defense. I sweep through the Flygon and make it back to the Salamence. This time, I survive Dragon Claw, and Hidden Power does 4 times damage, which knocks it out. That was a tricky fight, and I'm really glad I didn't have to use more rare candies, because I want to save them for Steven. Before I face him though, I have to defeat the champion. Okay, let's face Wallace. For this fight, I've given Sableye a Pecha Berry because Wallace loves his Toxic. As soon as this battle started, I started to regret teaching Hidden Power Ice over Shockwave. I really just wanted to keep Shadow Ball, Calm Mind, and Faint Attack for Drake and Wallace. There's only one other move slot to work with, so that's why I did it. In retrospect, while writing this script, I think it might have been better to unlearn Faint Attack and teach Hidden Power Ice in its place. After all, I could have used Hidden Power against the Kingdra in the case that Shadow Ball triggered the special defense drop. So for Wallace, I've set up fully, and I'm able to get through his team until the Gyarados comes out. But here, Sableye's Faint Attack doesn't do quite enough damage, even with plus 6. Because of that, the Gyarados ends the battle. I tried again to see if I just got too unlucky in the last fight, but it turns out the opposite was the case. This time, Sableye gets frozen by Whale Lord and knocked out before I complete the setup. Maybe if I have rest, I can more reliably set up against his lead? Well, this time Blizzard gets a critical hit and does so much damage. Oh, Sableye actually survives on one hit point. That's nice, rest to the rescue. But unfortunately, while Sableye is sleeping, Blizzard crits again and Whale Lord finishes it off. So I'm attacking Whale Lord first turn to reduce the damage from Water Spout. However, what I really should be concerned about is Blizzard, as it freezes Sableye for a second time. Wallace is getting really lucky right now. Uh. At some point, Blizzard and Waterspout aren't going to crit me or freeze me, and then I'm going to set up and knock the Whale Lord out. The very next battle, I managed to do it. Alright, let's start the sweep. Tentacruel falls to a single hit, Ludicolo as well, and then Whiskash 2. Okay, it's time for the Gyarados. This time, Faint Attack is enough, and I've made it to Wallace's ace, Milotic. First turn, Sableye does a lot of damage, taking it to orange, and Wallace chooses Toxic. Not a very good play. Sableye knocks it out on the next turn, and with that, I've done it. I beat the Pokemon League. It took Sableye 2 hours, 14 minutes, and 58 seconds, playing at 4 times game speed to beat the game. And this was 7 hours and 22 minutes of game time. I had 22 resets, and it finishes the league at level 64. However, the greatest opponent is still coming up next. I have to defeat Steven Stone. Doing these challenges, I'm starting to get a feel for how Emerald works. This game really does feel like it's over after you defeat Wallace. That's because, up until this point, the game has been fairly agnostic as to whether a Pokémon should be a physical attacker or a special attacker. They're both equally useful. However, after this point, the game favors Pokémon with high physical defense and high special attack. Because without these, you won't have a very good time against Steven. For example, Pokémon that have excellent physical attack and weaker physical defense are just not cut out to defeat him. So let's compare this with the late game boss in Crystal, which is Red. His team is a mix of Pokémon with six different types. Also, while his team is primarily special attackers, he does have Snorlax to really like just hold down the physical attack because Snorlax is amazing. Also, he has a mix between frail attackers and more tanky Pokemon like the Blastoise and the Snorlax. Because of the diversity of his team, it feels fair to compare Pokemon after they defeat him. However, in Emerald, this doesn't feel quite as fair. That's because Steven's team is highly centralized around steel and rock types and resisting physical category moves. So to adjust for this, I'm going to start recording times for all the Pokemon after they defeat Wallace. This way we can see how Pokemon that are physical attackers did in the game up until the point before Steven. For now though, I'll still be ranking Pokemon in the leaderboard based on their real-time finish after they defeat Steven. However, I will show their league finish as a secondary column so we can see how they've performed. After all, I think most of us here are data nerds, so uh, what's a few more columns in a spreadsheet? It's actually, uh, it's joy, that's what it is. So now, with that out of the way, let's face Steven.
Today, I'm not particularly worried about him because Sableye has Calm Mind as well as Hidden Power Ice and Feint Attack. Two powerful special moves and a move that sets up my special attack and then rest. So yeah, like I, I should be fine. To prepare for this fight, I used all seven of my rare candies so that Sableye is at the maximum possible level. Usually, Skarmory is a great lead to face when you want to set up, but today it goes for Toxic first turn and that consumes my Petra Berry, so I have to start attacking with plus one. Unfortunately, Sableye looks like it's only dealing one quarter. Then Skarmory hits with Steel Wing and it does the same amount. At this point, I got very worried. I want to set up to ensure that I can sweep, however, the Skarmory finishes me off with Aerial Ace. In the very next fight, the same scenario plays out. Skarmory is just aggressive enough that it's able to knock Sableye out before I fully set up. At this point, I really didn't want to go and train, so I tried again, but the same scenario plays out for a third time. Okay, I have to consider an alternative strategy. So something that might work is replacing Faint Attack with Water Pulse. After all, Steel types resist Dark type moves in Generation 3, just so you know, after Generation 6, Steel's resistance to Dark was removed. As well as the resistance to Ghost, by the way. Okay, so what I have to hope for here with Water Pulse would be to confuse Skarmory, and that lets Sableye maybe sneak into the rest of the fight. Plus, Water Pulse is going to be doing more damage against Pokémon like Armaldo anyways. However, Skarmory just finishes me off again. Okay, it's time to head back to Victory Road and do some training. I always plan this training around damage rounding thresholds, so once Sableye reaches level 67, I head over to the Safari Zone to pick up an additional rare candy that I normally skip. With it, I can get Sableye all the way up to level 75. Okay, let's try again. Please just let me set up against the Skarmory. This time, I get plus 4 and then Skarmory poisons Sableye. I go for Hidden Power and it does so much damage because of a critical hit, and Skarmory goes down to a single hit. Okay, that's good. Steven chooses Armaldo next. This uh, Steel Dark type is like quite scary. Looks like a Dark type, right? Like it's terrifying. Look at this thing. I contemplated for a while here if I should use Rest to heal Poison, but hearing the voice of the people in the comments, I decided to instead try to knock the Armaldo out. Unfortunately, Hidden Power only does a little bit more than half, and Armaldo gets an Ancient Power in, taking Sableye down to red after poison damage. As a result, once Claydol comes out, the poison polishes Sableye off. All I need is to be able to get plus 6. So how long is it going to take against the Skarmory? Well, I get plus 5 and then Skarmory knocks me out. But in the next fight after that, I finally manage to get plus 6. I heal with Rest, and at this point I realize that because of Skarmory's damage ranges, I can just continue to heal with Rest until Steel Wing misses. After all, it doesn't have perfect accuracy, and when that happens I can strike back and knock it out. As a result, I finish it off and Armaldo's next. I go for Hidden Power Ice with plus 6, and this thing still survives. Clearly, it is a Fire Ice type. I tried again, and this time I wanted to stall the Armaldo out with Rest because Ancient Power doesn't have very much PP. After that, I can finish my setup with Calm Mind on it, and then knock it out. Okay, can I sweep Steven's remaining 4 Pokémon? I think I can, but uh, Earthquake thinks I can't. Okay, ah, uh, Claydol got a crit, just great. I try the strategy again, but this time Skarmory finishes me off with a critical hit, so do I have to level up more? Maybe level 78 will give Sableye more success, but also, maybe bringing Water Pulse back into this fight is going to give me more damage against the Armaldo, plus the chance to confuse in the case that I don't KO. I lose once to Skarmory, and then I get plus 6 after stalling it out with Rest. Hidden Power one-shots, I go for Water Pulse on Armaldo, and it goes down. Okay, that's good. So does the Claydol, preventing it from getting any screens set up. That's really good. Aggron follows, Water Pulse 1 hits it too, leading to his Cradley. Now, this thing is a defensive beast, if you don't know. However, its best offensive move is Ancient Power, and it only knows Giga Drain other than that, so I should be able to stall it out with Rest. After healing, I decide that I should attack with Hidden Power, and it actually one-hits. Okay, so all that's left is Steven's Metagross. Between Hidden Power Ice and Water Pulse, the latter is the better choice. Sableye snaps out of confusion and hits Water Pulse, and it does just over half. Because I'm moving first, I'm gonna take it out. But then, Metagross eats its Citrus Berry, healing it just enough to survive my next hit on a sliver, and Sableye goes down. Okay, at this point, I was feeling pretty defeated. I've lost against Steven way too many times. So I decided to head back to Victory Road and train two more levels so that Sableye will be level 80. Now, if you're really attentive, you'll already be screaming at your screen because you know what the solution is here. We have to wait a little bit longer for me to figure it out. 
At level 80, I'm still losing to Steven because like Skarmory can just finish me or like Cradily can finish me because it can confuse me and hit me with ancient power. When I make it back to the Metagross, I was convinced that I would knock it out. But once again, even over the next damage rounding threshold, the Citrus Berry heals it just enough. Sableye can't knock it out and Sableye faints. At this point, I was feeling pretty hopeless. I was like, I'm gonna have to train to level 83 or 85 or something like that. It's gonna take a long time to do that. But then at my lowest moment, when all of the desperation was setting in, I realized what the solution was. Remember cast form? Well, when this guy in the Weather Institute gives it to you, I always mention that it isn't the real reward, because the real prize is the mystic water that it's holding. I can use this item to boost Water Pulse's damage by 10%, and this small boost is exactly what I need to get the extra damage against Metagross. I finish it in the next fight, and Sableye defeats Steven with a time of 3 hours, 13 minutes, and 3 seconds. That's a lot, of, a lot of threes in there. <laughs> with 39 resets at level 80 in 9 hours and 29 minutes of game time. As the most recent Pokemon Emerald playthrough that I've done, Sableye has earned itself a disappointing finish. It's actually third to last right now. Even Shift Tree was faster than it. I'd really like to in the future go back and optimize this playthrough more. I think that having a nature that boosts my special attack would have just helped way more. Like, yeah, I think I'm done boosting defensive stats, that's not going to happen anymore. Overall here, the minus speed wasn't much of an issue. I think that a neutral speed nature with a plus special attack and minus, let's say, special defense might be good here, especially with how much calm mind I'm using. While I was producing this video and writing the script with Leary, we were talking about the ghost dark type and how awesome it is. She mentioned that Sableye is sort of like the prequel to Spiritomb, and I agree with this. It's definitely the discount version of the superior ghost. It's like when you go into Best Buy and you're like, hey, like I need a cable. And you're like, well, this cable here, this insignia cable seems like the best cable that I can buy because it's quite cheap. And then you take it home and you like plug it in and it breaks two days later. Yeah, that's how Sableye felt. Anyways, the exciting thing about doing a Sableye playthrough is that it has a counterpart, which is Mawile. And I'm very excited to use that thing. So stay tuned for that in the near future. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo so you're notified when that video comes out. I'm doing a video a day during December. And also, leave a comment on these videos because I gotta read them all, and it's gonna be a huge task in January. Thanks to all my patrons for their support. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video. In the Team Aqua hideout, I'm proud of myself because I don't forget the person berry against Matt. Nice jeans, Matt. Uh, also, nice balls. <laughs> that line! How did, why did I write that line? If there's no bloopers in this video, this is the only blooper. The line, nice jeans, Matt. Also nice balls. It's like stupidest line ever. Oh. Hashtag manscaped. <laughs> like, gosh. And then it's time for me to face Wallace. And then it's time for me to face Juan. And then Wallace gives me access to Juan's gym. Makes sense, right? Wallace heals it. I wrote Wallace heals it. This is Juan. <laughs> Not Wallace. Juan heals it. I switch into paint. Paint attack. <laughs> The script in this one is so bad. Wallace heals it. I switch into paint attack. Oh gosh. Paint attack. You just like splash paint on the opponent. It's like becomes Splatoon. Looks like Shadow Ball's doing about a third, but unfortunately it survives the third hit and Wallace heals it. No! But Kingdra, inspired by my Pokemon Yellow Vision. Blah. But Kingdra, inspired by my. But Kingdra, inspired by my Pokemon Yellow videos. But Kingdra, inspired by my play in Pokemon Yellow, uses rest and heals its stadies. Stat stadies. Oh my gosh.